Disclaimer. Please check your playback settings. Ensure you are listening to this podcast at normal speed. Unless you want us to sound drunk. Then play at half speed. Thank you. They're supposed to be announcing the winner tonight. Tom! Tom! Turn on the TV! Right, pretty good! Pretty good! Just turn it up! Jeez, I'm doing the best I can! Slow it down! Shh. Polls are closed and election results are still coming in. It's being estimated that there was a record average of... Is anyone else concerned that we're not there? Would you be quiet? 35% of the polls reporting in, and we'll be writing them all night long. (laughs) He said polls. Real mature there, Josh. I I honestly can't believe you're still running for office. We are standing by to give you the latest updates. We join Tom's lover and mistress, Joan Walzanowski, at the polling station now. Joan? Hey, hey! I was watching that! I'm not sorry! Well, I doubt they'll announce the winner anytime soon. I mean, probably not, but, you know, well, I'd like to say I could have done more in the final stretch, but our campaigns, uh... They were a bit of a plane wreck at the end and only getting worse. Yeah, that's a polite way of putting it. Speaking of tangents, do you guys remember that plane crash we were in a few years ago? What? No. God, no, I haven't thought about that in a long time. Long time. Long time. Long time. Long time. <laughs> Oh god! I, I think the pilot's dead! They're all gonna die! Why is the pilot dead? Don't worry guys, I've got this. <gasps> Thank you, Aaron! Really glad we decided to invite you last minute! <laughs> and Tom's gone fetal. And I'm right behind him! That whole thing, it just, it keeps me awake at night. Wait, what are you guys talking about? Why am I hungry? Whatever happened to Aaron? Have I completely blocked him out? Seriously, though, we should eat. They were our best friend for, like, 20 years. He did save us that day. Why am I drawing a blank? Aaron. Aaron. Wait, it was something. Are you guys feeling barbecue? I could go for a brisket right now. Ooh, or some ribs. Josh, what are you getting at? It's like, I got this memory about Aaron. Like, seriously, I have zero recollection of this guy, and you say we were friends for 20 years? Was he a chef or a cook or something? I'm kind of remembering something, too. Yeah, it was like after the crash, we all survived, but then... Did we go to school together? Did we take some culinary courses together? Did we eat out a lot together? I remember the camp. The shelter. Oh god, the snow. Why was there snow on a desert island? Uh, then the, there was a rescue in... Uh... Oh my god. Why are you looking at me like that? No. No way. Was it? I think it was. Uh... Yeah, let's just watch a movie, guys. Not only are we taking Jaden Martell to Midnight Special America, but we're going to take Kirsten Dunst to Wag the Dog, and then Willie Nelson to Swing Vote, Dennis Hopper to Cool Hand Luke, George Kennedy to Flight of the Phoenix, then all the way to Jimmy Stewart to Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. Yeah! Grab your tiny flags and hop on the bandwagon, because we're hitting the campaign trail. Join Dan, Tom, and Josh on their Whistle Stop campaign trail. Shaking hands and kissing babies all the way to Mr. Smith goes to Washington! Ask not what the fire pit can do for you, ask what you can do with the fire pit! This was the best selling novel of man's pride and fury. And this is the motion picture exulting in the vastness of human hope and human courage to scale new heights of adventure. Nine men whose very lives turn on one of the most startling, ironic twists of fate you have ever experienced in a motion picture. Unusual men, star dancers, Superb performances from a cast of brilliant stars assembled from around the world. Sometimes, 
a motion picture sets the screen on fire. Evening, Bucks and listeners, and welcome to another episode of The Fire Pit. I'm Tom, parliamentary name Thompson, and we're almost there, people. The Whistle Stop campaign trail to Washington is almost at an end. We've fought the law. We've eluded scandal. Cast a vote incorrectly, and had a failure to communicate all the best parts of a campaign trail. Tonight, though, we crash a plane and try to get it back in the air. Totally not an analogy for the political system. And here to tell us who we're watching, what we're watching, and why we're watching it, I surrender the podium to... Nigel. Thank you, Tom. Hello, all. I'm Nigel, Senate name Dan. And last week, we followed the criminally underused Dennis Hopper from Swing Vote to being used correctly, but he was in a minor role in Cool Hand Luke, a feel-good prison story in the same vein as Elvis Presley's Jailhouse Rock, at least for the first 45 minutes. Uh, But, you know, it was still a great film. Uh, Paul Newman is damn sexy without a shirt. He is, okay? I said it. My mother was right all along. But while the movie was a Paul Newman movie in every sense of the word, the real man who stole the show in that movie was one George Kennedy, who rightfully did win the Oscar for Best Supporting Actor for that role. And tonight, we follow George into 1965's The Flight of the Phoenix. And to give us a rundown of this film, the floor recognizes Josh. Thank you, Dan. Hope Tom doesn't forget you someday. I'm Josh, parliamentary name Reginald. And as mentioned, for tonight, we are watching The Flight of the Phoenix, starring George Kennedy, who we're following from last week's amazing performance, definitely the standout character of Cool Hand Luke. Um, He will co-star alongside such titans as Ernest Borgnine, Richard Attenborough, you know him as John Hammond from Jurassic Park, Peter Finch, Peter Finch, the mad-as-hell guy from Network, and the one, the only... The ever amazing Sir Jimmy Stewart. I don't think he was knighted because he's American, but Jimmy Stewart. Once again, this film is based on a book. I don't have any information on that book. Tom, edit that out. (laughs) (laughs) So this movie was released December 15th, 1965. It has a runtime of 142 minutes and had a budget of $3.8 million with a box office return of $3 million. So that'd be around $24 million in 2019 money. Why did you do 2019 money? I think I still have 2020 thing left open from last week. I, I really don't think money's gotten much more or less in a year. So I think that's still... I think you would be surprised. No, it's about it the same. So yeah, about $24 million in today's money. Which is still low budget, uh, no matter which way you swing it. Well, also keep in mind that it's like I always say the box office was much different 20 and 30 years ago. Than it is today. It was definitely a lot different. 1965 was that like 60 years ago? Shoot, 55 years ago. Yeah. Yep. So yeah, it was definitely a lot different 55 years ago. Even then, like you weren't putting as much money or at least percentage capital into movies because you weren't expecting to get that much back out of them. You didn't have the home market, and movies were in theaters a lot longer. So, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of box office release data about this one because it was released 55 years ago. I was also, when I was researching this movie and we were talking last week, actually, during Cool Hand Luke about um, how the box office was a little bit different. Um, I found out in the 60s, because they didn't have the home video market that we have today um, or that we would later get, movies would actually also be re-released in theaters. Like, they would run for a little while and then maybe a year later or so, they'd go back into theaters and people would go and see it either again or if you didn't get a chance to watch it the first time they would go through and then that's kind of what they did um also theaters were structured a little bit differently back then most of the time you bought a ticket and you got two movies out of it especially if you went to like a matinee or something so you would watch the first movie and then another movie so the box office was a little a lot different back then than it is today if you're one of those guys that likes getting movie posters, especially of old films, that's why you'll see various versions of the same movie. Because, yeah, as they re-release them, and they'd have different dates, too, just because...
does. Yeah, it's like you'd have a 61 release in like 1967. I, I don't know how many times Garden with the Wind was re-released, but yeah, you'd have that. Although, Josh, you're right and slightly not quite right about movies at the time. They did have their big budgets. In terms of other films that were released at this time, this was a very low budget film, especially adjusted to inflation. Uh, We're talking about this film kind of being a box office bomb, more or less, because it didn't make its money back. Another film that was released around this same time, a blockbuster film, The Greatest Story Ever Told. Uh, which was a film about the life of Jesus Christ, which had a budget of $20 million and a box office of $15 million. Well, I'm saying 19- percentage-wise, like $3.8 million was a huge budget for 1965. Mm-hmm. But in, adjusted for inflation, that's like $30 million, which today's standards is a very low-budget movie. And it doesn't hurt that with this film, the majority of it takes place in a single location with one airplane, a bunch of guys. It's essentially a bottle episode or a bottle movie, if you will. So that probably helped keep it down in terms of price. This movie's got a 90% on Rotten Tomatoes. Does it really? Yeah, and and an 8 out of 10 on IMDb. So I guess it was a box office dud, but I mean, I was telling a lot of people what we were watching this week for our podcast and every one of them said the remake or the original. And I said, the original and like, Oh my God, that's such a good movie. I got that all the, all week. Oh my God, that's such a good movie. Oh my God, that's such a good movie. And I'm like, wow, I guess 90% on Rotten Tomatoes is kind of correct. Maybe I guess we'll find out because I've actually never seen this movie. I honestly didn't know it was a remake until we showed our lists. Like I'd seen the original, not knowing it was a remake back in when it was released in 2004, 2005. Yeah, the yeah. Was 04. Yeah, the remake was 04. That was Dennis Quay, Giovanni Ribisi, and Hugh Laurie. I think Hugh Laurie was in it. Was he really? Yeah, yeah I, think I think you're so. right. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I want to say he auditioned for House on the set of that movie. Heck of an audition tape. Nice. Yeah. No, I didn't know. I've never seen the the remake, but I remember the previews for it. It's like, why are you remaking this? They did it right the first time. It was a Jimmy Stewart thing. Stop ruining a good thing. Then again, I've never seen the original one either, so who's to say? I I honestly agree with that meme I see on Reddit or Facebook or something every now and again where they say, like, stop remaking good movies and remake bad movies to try to get them right. Like, why don't they do that? Like, I would say, yeah, don't remake Cool Hand Luke. Flight of the Phoenix probably didn't need to be remade. But, like, Swashbuckler? No, don't remake that one. Definitely don't remake that one. Just forget that movie was created. They did remake Swashbuckler. It's called Pirates of the Caribbean. It was done much better. No, ah. no, no. <laughs> <laughs> also, Tom, edit this out, but um, you guys ruined one of my trivia questions. Oh, shit. Did we? Yes. Well, if you had You're welcome. Us. Well, no, you still got to say it then, because then we can have a callback to the earlier part of the episode <laughs> to see if our listeners are paying attention. Hey! There'll be a test on this later, literally. So, anywho, Tom, what are you hoping to get out of this film? Well, I'm fairly optimistic about this. For one, it's a Jimmy Stewart. Come on, guys. Even his worst film is still better than most people's best film, just from what I've seen. I can't really lose with him. Plus, we have a really decent track record with... Okay, no, I take that back because now I'm remembering Dead Calm, and that was based on a book as well. So, let me amend that. I'm a little concerned because it is based on a book and we have a hit and miss record on those. But this film is still considered a classic just because it you know, didn't find its audience back in the time. Everyone was too busy watching The Sound of Music for the 50th time. Yeah, this, that, this film came out that same time. Somehow that one film made like 50 million in the box office. This barely made anything. No justice. I'm looking forward to the hype. I'm keeping my expectations reasonable. Because it is a 1960s film, a lot of our sensibilities are kind of 2000s, everything's exciting, everything's super tense, everything's Dutch angles, that sort of thing. I'm keeping in mind, like, no, this is probably going to be shot very similar to how Cool Hand Luke was, very grounded, very eye-level sort of thing. No, I'm expecting to like this, guys. I'm I'm looking forward to this. Um, so you've never seen this movie either, Tom? No. It's one of those things. It's a film that everyone says great things about. It's listed as one of Jimmy Stewart's top 
films. I don't know where it stands in the top 100, but I think it's on there somewhere. Yet somehow I've never had a chance to watch it, which has always disappointed me, but I'm glad I'm able to do it here. It's like I saved myself for this moment. Nice. Thank well, you. I mean, I, I got really high expectations for this film. Like I said, all this week, all I heard from people was, oh, it's a good movie. Oh, it's a great movie. That's a great movie. Especially from my uh, my mom was like, oh my god, that's one of Jimmy Stewart's best films. And I'm like looking at the cast, and it's Jimmy Stewart, George Kennedy, Ernest Borgnine, Richard Attenborough. I'm like, oh, okay. Seriously, how did this movie not make its budget back? But I got some really high expectations for this film, as I usually do when a film has 90 plus on Rotten Tomatoes. I mean, that's just your movie be- it better deliver. If it's a 50 percent film or a 40 percent film, and I watch it and I don't like it, that's okay. I'm with 60% of the audience. Mm -hmm. But if I watch a film like on Rotten Tomatoes, that has got like 80, 90, 95%, and I don't like it, then I think, is there something wrong with me? Did I not get this? Iron Man 2, cough, cough. Iron Man 3, (laughs) cough, cough. Yeah, Yeah, so I've seen the remake, so I know some of the beats of the story. Like, I know what the general plot is, but Mm -hmm. I've not seen the original. And I haven't watched the remake in a very long time. Do you remember what your thoughts were of the remake? Well, I I rented it for a dollar out of Redbox, and I was glad I only paid a dollar to see it. I thought it was a serviceable film. It was decent, but I don't really remember that much of it. Like, I don't remember, like, the cool parts of it, and I don't remember too much about the movie, like, other than it was meh. The, The movie was a cheeseburger at McDonald's. It satisfied me while I was watching it. I enjoyed it. An hour later, I was hungry again. Well, if it's anything, I mean, I don't know who directed the remake, but at least this one had Robert Aldrich's, which if you're a fan of The Dirty Dozen, that was one of the films he directed. So you're probably going to get about the same style. So I think that's a good sign for you, Nigel. Okay, well, um, I've seen the remake. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, judging from an earlier conversation a week or two ago, Josh, I think you've seen the remake too. So I guess we're going to have to compare some notes tonight. Yeah, definitely. I know um, I didn't hate the remake. Um, this was in an era when I was working mid shift and I was single and I would just go to the store on my, my way to work. Cause I walked, I would buy a movie and I would go watch it at work because working in the mid shift, literally nothing happened. And I want to say that this movie was one of the movies that I purchased and I went to watch it. I watched it once and I probably have the DVD in a binder somewhere in my house. Hmm. But uh, I remember thinking this isn't a bad film and this is a remake, mind you. I remember a couple creatively done segments on it. And again, I'm talking about the remake where they talk about this one dude who's going to walk one direction to get to the nearest civilization. And then somebody talks about how he may favor his right leg and that's going to put him off course like 25 miles and he's going to miss it completely and die of dehydration. And I vaguely remember thinking the way they shot that particular scene of him walking out into the desert and dying a lonely death while he's explaining it to him was pretty interestingly done. But overall, it felt like a paint-by-numbers movie. I honestly, up until we chose this, I didn't realize that that was a remake. I think this is the second time I've mentioned this tonight. So I unfortunately have not as many people to talk to on a day-to-day basis, with the exception of you two. (laughs) So I didn't have people telling me how much they enjoyed this movie. So I am going into this completely blind only knowing that I do enjoy Jimmy Stewart. I've seen a number of his movies, and every single one of them I have enjoyed. I can't say that about Kevin Costner anymore. (laughs) So, but I do have high expectations for this one. But this is another interesting point of this journey, that this will be our second movie in this journey that the three of us have not seen. And it'll be the sixth movie that we have not seen. Do you realize that if we both, if we all come out of this movie liking it, that means one third of the movies we went into blind, we will like. Oh my, yeah, because I think, what was it, um, Midnight Express was the first film where none of us had seen and we all walked away liking? Yeah, because Scary Stories, we all walked away kind of meh. Like, yeah. did, we didn't hate it, but we didn't love it. And the others we viscerally hated. The Pathfinder, Swashbuckler, Dead Calm. Dead Calm. Like, we hated those films. Those, yeah, those are garbage films. And, like, we could see qualities of scary stories. Mm-hmm. But uh, overall, it was just not a good film. But it was a film that we, well, I wouldn't even say really enjoyed, but it wasn't as bad as the other three. Well, we're also looking at better writing and acting in this this one too and same with the last one um um midnight express much better acting and writing this one of course lucas heller 
who wrote Dirty Dozen, Jimmy Stewart, who was, for those who've never seen a Jimmy Stewart film, it was the Tom Hanks of his time. So I think that's going in, that's going to favor us. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why I'm also confident that this is going to help continue the trend of us watching films none of us has seen and walking away liking at the same time. Yeah, I'm excited. I've been excited to see this film all week, mostly because I'm hearing from a lot of people that it's such a great film. And I mean, it's it's, it's Jimmy Stewart. And like you said, that his worst movie is better than a lot of people's best. Mm-hmm. So I'm you know excited. what I'm excited about? What are you excited about, Josh? I don't know, Dan. Why don't you quiz me on it? <laughs> Ooh, smooth. That was, that was smooth. That was smooth. <laughs> Okay, well, we, um, we've we got tr- uh, Flight of the Phoenix trivia tonight. Uh, we are not doing IMDb reviews um, because uh, it was so successful last time that I've tweaked my format. And now instead of uh, 15 questions, I've doubled it to 30. Uh, each one is worth one-third of a point. Um, but there's only a bonus point if you get the third question right, every third question right, and you can name the year that the actor was got the script in the mail to accept the role that he portrayed. I'm sorry, guys, you're <laughs> cutting out. It's really... Can't driving get... through a tunnel. I, I can't hear you either. If this, was, you... if this was a video podcast, both of you would have that meme of the math equations going over your head right now. I just have a 404 error going in my head at the moment. And Tom quits. I win by default. I got the quiz. I got the quiz next week. All right, let's go ahead and start watching this movie. <laughs> <laughs> All right, ask your questions, Bridge Keeper. We're not afraid. All right. So, uh, Tom, since you have been the gracious loser for I think twenty weeks now, um, we're no. going to we're going to start two with weeks. Here. Thank you. No. Okay. You Bro, haven't okay. won this entire journey. Yeah, you haven't won. You hit, yeah, you haven't. You haven't. I don't. I think. I think it. Or no. The. I think scary. No, you didn't even get to do. I don't think Tom's won till like we got out of since we got out of Jaws. <laughs> it's like wow. Ha, no, wow. no, no. Wait, shit. Yeah, since we changed the rules to the winner, uh, does it? Oh God. Because I shit. had the losing streak of like three weeks, and then Tom <laughs> just decided to double it. <laughs> Anything you can do, I can do better. You could take it. It's yours. <laughs> okay, so explain the rules once more, Nigel. Okay, so no, honestly, this one's this one's easier. I'm going to ask you each a question. I'm going to start with Tom, and it's a multiple choice question. So I'll give you the the choices. You choose the choice. If you get it right, you get a point. If you get it wrong, it goes to the the next person. Do not speak out of turn. If after I finish the question and give the choices. And one of you speaks out of turn, even if it's the correct answer, you don't get the point, and nobody wins. Okay. So there's only five questions, so there's a, a, at least one for a tiebreaker. Although I do have a tiebreaker in the wait, waiting in the wind if uh, we get to it, or if we need it. So all right, uh, mostly that's a, that's mostly if one of you speaks out of turn and the point doesn't count. Josh. <laughs> so that's he explained the rules this time. Jesus okay. Christ. So, Tom, are you ready? No. Too bad. Question one. As, as stated last week, George Kennedy was in a movie with Chuck Norris in the 1980s. What movie was it? A, Invasion USA, B, Lone Wolf McQuaid, C, The Delta Force, or D, Breaker Breaker? Delta Force. Correct. Tom gets a point. Woo! I hate this format. Catholic school has trained me for multiple choice questions. Woo! All right. Well, Josh, you might be able to get this one. Number two. While in the 60s and 70s, George Kennedy was mostly known for playing serious characters with hearts of gold. In the 80s, he surprised everyone with his comedic talents in what comedy film? A. Airplane. B. The Naked Gun. C. Spaceballs. Or D. Stripes. Do I know it? Don't think it's Spaceballs. Um... Leslie Nielsen was Naked Gun and Airplane. I haven't seen those movies in ages, but I don't know if he was in them or not. Oh, God. Is he an airplane? I'm going to go with Airplane. Mm. Tom? Naked Gun! He was the chief! Holy shit, yes. I never recognized yes. him! George Kennedy is in the Naked Gun. You better not have Googled that. I oh, didn't. God. I love those films. I watch those all okay. the time. 
That's I, yeah, okay, because yeah, if you Google that, that's that's cheating. There's no Google. No, I don't need a Google on a Leslie Nielsen film. I don't think I've ever seen Naked Gun. Oh, such a good film. You also need to see the uh, TV show it was based on, uh, Files from Police Force. Great show, ahead of its time. Only had half a season. Disappointing. All right, Nigel, question number three. I'm on a roll. All right. This movie was remade in 2004, starring what amazing would-be astronaut in Jimmy Stewart's role of Frank Towns? Was it A, Randy Quaid, B, Bill Pullman, C, Bill Paxton, or A, Dennis Quaid? You mean D. Dennis Quaid. <laughs> Repeat that. Seriously, cool- this is bullshit. <laughs> so I'm going to go with the first one. Randy Quaid. Wait, shit. No, I almost he did it went again. with it. It's, uh, yeah, it's, to me, it's D. Right. Dennis <laughs> Quaid. Quaid. <laughs> point, goes to, point, point goes to Josh on a quote unquote bullshit gimme. So, uh, yeah, Dan, the Quaid's get me again every time. Oh, yeah. Um, you still want to yell and be angry, Josh, or do you want me to keep going with this trivia? <laughs> I want to yell and be angry, but go ahead. All right. Number four, George Kennedy had a big role in what prominent disaster film series? A, the airport series, B, the Poseidon Adventure series, C, Skyscraper, or D, A Crack in the Earth. What was A? Airport. The airport series. There's like five or six airport movies. I've never heard of them. Really? So that airport, Poseidon, I, thought that, I think Poseidon was only one movie. They had a remake with Russell somebody. What was C? Skyscraper. Never heard of that one. What's D? A crack in the earth. Never heard of that one. I'll go with A, since you kind of confirmed it. <laughs> yes, he was in the airport series. <laughs> Wait, which what? Who? Which actor was in the airport series? George Kennedy. He's the only actor in all the airport movies. He's in airport. He's in airport 1970. He's in uh, airport 1977, and then he's in a, he's in the movie called Concord, uh, airport 79, or something like that. So he's the I'm only. I'm winning that, or I'm on. We're tied up. Oh, so we're tied. Nice dumb Hang on, yeah. I'm, I'm, I need to take a minute because not only did they make airport for real, I thought that was just like a joke sort that's of trailer. Or air- airplane. Airplane is the parody movie that parodied airport in the original airport movie. Oh, really? Yeah, just like Spaceballs was a parody of Star Trek and Star Wars, Airplane was a parody of airport. I guess that's one of those examples of the parody being more successful than the original, because I didn't even know that. Yeah, I just remember the airplane crashing into, like, the tarmac or the terminal. I'm thinking, that's dumb. That's got to be a joke trailer. I learned today that they took it seriously. Wow. All right, well, we're tied. So let's go to the tiebreaker question. Now, this is the tiebreaker question. So this one, I don't have buzzers. So we're going to do this old school. I'm going to read off the question. I'm going to read off the choices. And then whoever says their name first is the buzzer, and they get to answer the question. Is that and fair? We can't say our names until you've said the last yes, multiple yes. choice, right? Yeah, I have to say the last multiple choice. Okay, so number five. George Kennedy and Jimmy Stewart were best friends. Other than their shared love of acting, what other hobby did they share? Was it A, hunting, B, race cars, C, aviation, or D, woodworking? Josh. Ding. Josh. D, woodworking. Oh, wrong. Tom, you get a chance. Um, I'm going to say the third one. Airplanes. Aviation? Yes, they were both pilots. Tom was... wins trivia. Oh, the my show... God. I lost to Tom. <laughs> the streak oh! is over. The streak is over. Tom wins trivia. I'm, go I'm taking myself. a lap. I'm taking a lap around the track. Woo! Woo-hoo! The drought is done. Let it rain. Oh, oh. oh this feels like the this feels like the the Cubs winning the series a couple years ago when uh, when Joe Joe Buck was like, next year is finally here. Tom wins oh, trivia. The streak uh, is over. You did kind of give it to him, Dan. No, you got no. that gimme. No, you I got the gimme, Josh. I should have been this question. Really? What are you complaining about? Yo, the, the whole like Dennis Quaid, Randy Quaid. You, I only got that wrong because I can't tell the two apart. I'm just which... bitter because I lost. Uh, I tried really hard on this one this week. Too. <laughs> 
Well, you didn't account for Josh. Uh, Dan, Dan, it's not just that I lost. I lost to Tom, which inevitably is the only person I could possibly lose to in this podcast. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right, because you and I kept trading off trivia. I approve of this quiz 100%, Nigel. I think it's great. I can't wait for the Idiot. next one. Uh, these new rules you've put in place, amendments, just perfect. Keep it going. Job well done. You know what? You know what? You know what? Tom, play the music. Welcome back to another soaring episode of The Fire Pit. I am, as always, your interspersal host, editor, and co-pilot, Tom. And according to this bottle of Jim Beam, the horizon should be just about down that way. Woo. Thanks for flying the friendly skies with us as we cruise on through this whistle stop campaign trail, jumping from the train to the plane as we head through our second to last destination before Mr. Smith goes to Washington. And speaking of politics, I'm getting word that there are some developments in the fire pit campaigns. Let's tune in and find out just what's happening. Mm, chicken wings were such a good idea. Jesus Christ, would you shut up? Do you guys think that our scandals hurt the campaigns? <laughs> Maybe yours did. I mean, you do want robots to take over the world and shit. Seriously? That's where you're going with this? You give a shout out to an imaginary person every week. I'm just glad that mine blew over. Jesus Christ, Tom, shut up. Hang on, they're talking about the election again. Welcome back to America Makes a Poor Decision. I'm rather not. Joining us on site is our own Joan Walzanowski. She's at the polls now. Joan? Thank you, Rather. It's still too close to call here. As you can see, voter turnout is extraordinary. This election is definitely going to come down to the wire. But I do want to direct your attention over here as a group of protesters have gathered across the street. Surely protesting candidate Tom, whose scandal rocked the very foundations of this country? A scandal that will go down in history, not like some of the worst? No, they seem to be protesting McDonald's removing the all-day breakfast menu. Truly a stupid decision, and one worthy of such intense protest. Hey, I was watching that! I don't care. Alright guys, I'm gonna go protest. I'm protesting McDonald's, not Tom. You know, this is dumb. I'm just gonna go play on my computer. That I got from Rob's Custom PCs! Hey! Um, um, chicken nom. Oh boy, sounds like we're gonna have to make a quick stop through the drive-thru at this rate. Mmm, McGriddles. But, if you have any goings-on, or news to tell us about, or want to fill this space with words about your products, feel free to email us at curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com. That's curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com. Just put fire pit in the subject line, as well as what it is you're emailing in regards, such as questions, comments, concerns, statements, and just let us know what you have for us, and we'll take that email, give it the full up and down and all around, print it out, then fold that printout into a paper airplane, send it far into the horizon, and never let you know where it landed. Because we threw that plane in the air, and where it lands, I'm sure you don't care. But that email, which you do care about, again, is Curtain call entertainment inc at gmail.com capital c capital c capital e capital i at gmail.com wait since when do these things take gasoline oh boy looks like i'm gonna have to land this one early i'll let you guys get back to the show thank you all for listening and as always good And now to check on the team to see how they're enjoying their movie. All right, we're off to a good start. Things are really taking off now. 
Get out. There's a Hillary Clinton joke there, I know. <laughs> We're going to be on time it. in Benghazi. Let's just leave that alone for a while. <laughs> <laughs> Please, thank you. Holy shit, that is that yeah. in Yeah. Wait, where? The Damn. guy with the hat. Wow, he looks weird without a beard. It's bad, no expense. That's going to be my he did it for Krypton all night, by the way. Just let you guys know. I I'm love how this guy right there is just watching porn in public. It's like me at the library. He's reading it for the articles. I go to Pornhub for the ads. Listen to that music. giving me a headache. Racist! He's canceled. Oh, there's no way we can get around it in our airplane. There's no escaping this sandstorm. If only there was some way we could go over it, but no. They obviously spared the expense. I always feel like Jimmy Stewart's doing an impression of Jimmy Stewart. Save well, the playboy. He died doing what he loved himself. <laughs> I'm glad we have these audio cues. I wouldn't know to be in suspense, because what the hell was he just looking at? <laughs> Ernest Borgnine always plays Ernest Borgnine, but he plays Ernest Borgnine so well. I can see why he had a very long career playing Ernest Borgnine. I mean, if they fix the radio, they can just say, hey, um, help? Almost unlimited to buy a press date. Press date? All that good for is regularity. Yeah, well, they'll keep you alive. Well, also, you've got some uh, fresh meat just over the hill there. Just uh, putting that on the table, guys. Hey, it's been in the sand for like three days. It's cooked. Yeah. I'm a horrible person. <laughs> you are. I would be well, really Tom's bad. Tom's the one who pointed it out first, though. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, he ate Aaron, so. You keep talking about that. He's like, is that a rib house? Because I have got a craving for pork. <laughs> I believe we'll all be dead. Hey, don't you tell the truth here. Spared but... no expense on it. <laughs> That guy looks like Daniel Craig playing James Bond dressed as a German. Now I can't not see it. <laughs> I'm loving this guy's acting. He's like, he knows it is the dumbest idea. Yeah, I've known Airman like that. I'll be alright tomorrow. I mean, do you do you have somewhere you need to be? Like, right now? Like, I mean, if you don't leave tonight, does the shop close? I'm confused. Sit the fuck down. <laughs> He's got desert madness. Anybody want to go with Fritz's idea to uh, build a new plane? Yeah, I'm on board. Okay. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah. Worst thing is, we all die. Yeah. At least it'll be quick. Maybe. Not for you, though. Yeah, that was Tom when we had our plane accident. I don't remember anything like that. No. I mean... I remember it. Vivid as day. So you guys pulling my leg? Because I remember... Hang on. I remember something about wings. I remember wings and smoking. A lot of smoked meat. Nope, nothing coming to me. Spared no expense. <laughs> Nicely done, Reginald. Is there something mentally wrong with Ernest Borgnine's character? Drop the word character from that sentence. <laughs> and the answer is yes. <laughs> That would be me after, like, three hours. That would be me. I would literally get over the hill. You uh, you wouldn't actually have to walk very far to find me. It would be right over the first dune, just laying there in the sand. Like, Dan, how far did you walk? Uh, about five and a half feet. <laughs> and you're just laying right next to the airplane. Like, uh, so far. They're, they're literally talking to you from under the shade. Dan, just come back. <laughs> Did you really need to expend that much energy there, Jimmy? Josh, I've listened to you question Jimmy Stewart since the opening frame of this movie. I will listen to it no longer. I'd rather take it than just sit around here waiting to die. I'd rather not spare the expense. All right, but I'm not dragging him back. No, we need the meat. Boy, wouldn't you like to be the guy coming up with the sound effects for this scene? Give me the sound of an airplane wing being drug over an airplane. I just have these two washing gloves and some water. Hang on, let me try wringing my hands. How's that? Perfect. You might not have been a second-rate navigator in a fifth-grade outfit. And if you hadn't stayed in your bunk to kill that last bottle, you might have checked that engineer's report on the radio, and we might not be here. Jesus. Remind me never to piss off Jimmy Stewart. This will be a mighty helicopter. But we're not building a helicopter. Sir, he's been out in the sun for like three days. Oh, God. 
Also, he's been drinking the antifreeze, thinking... <laughs> we shall sail the seven seas with this boat. He's got the space madness. A god himself will not stop us this time. This cruise liner shall sail across the Atlantic in a day. They will fly across the Atlantic and we will show the Americans just how powerful the German Empire really is. And bomb Pearl Harbor. <laughs> Sirs, we're still in a desert. Put your pants back oh, on. No, 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 no. This is entertaining. Somebody get him some more antifreeze. Send people. So uh, Jimmy Stewart's kind of dressed up like Alan Grant from Jurassic Park. Looks like meat's back on the menu, boys. And there's camel, too. Yeah. <laughs> Gross. <laughs> this is the first woman in this movie, and she's not even real. Don't hear me complaining. No, Captain. No, you tried that a couple days ago, and it ended horribly. You went out with two and came back with one. Yes, you're right. He was clearly slowing me down. Now it's just me. I stand better chance. Has he been drinking the antifreeze, too? Yes, sir. <laughs> he builds models. Oh, I'm so glad you guys didn't tell me anything. Oh, that's even better than any other reveal I could have come up with. But I love that they included that about that character, because it now throws us, the audience, into doubt. Like, will this work? <laughs> He's going <laughs> to... <laughs> He's seething. Jimmy Stewart's going to kill a man. That's the laughter of someone whose electrical fence system just went down. See, shows what you know, German airplane builder guy. Airplane toy builder guy. Roads? Where we're going, we don't need roads. Oh, wait. Sorry, wrong movie. Has the captain been drinking the antifreeze now? Yes, everyone has. He did it! That crazy <laughs> son of a bitch, he did it! So, uh, where are we flying to? I hadn't thought that far ahead. <laughs> Honestly, I, I didn't even think we'd get this far. I didn't think we'd get out of the fucking sand. <laughs> now land in those oil fields. The gasoline will break our fall. Boom, they're all dead. I'm going to kill you when this is over. You know that. Right? <laughs> You're dead. I said it before the plane took off. I'm going to wind you up and see if you roll on the floor. <laughs> they will never act like they did in the 60s. Is that a good thing or a bad thing, Josh? Yes. I'm shocked they haven't remade this movie. I think it's best that they haven't. You know, it's very respectful of them. Yeah, I mean, who would they get to act in this? Randy Quaid? Fuck you, Josh. <laughs> so we may have to do the remake someday, only if only to make America Quaid again. Yes. Yes. And now, back to the episode. That was a movie. Uh, and it was a good one. So Yeah. Yes. Happy surprise right there. All right. So shall I rattle off a summary real quick and then we can get into final thoughts? Yes. Fire yeah. away there, Nigel. Oh, Josh seems eager. Well, it is, um, for those listeners right now, it is 2.20 in the morning. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay. So the movie starts with a plane flying in the air, a cargo plane, and we're introduced to our main protagonist, uh, Mr. Jimmy Stewart, playing Frank Towns. He's flying this cargo plane over a desert. Then we're introduced to Richard Attenborough's character, which is his navigator. And then there's a bunch of passengers on the plane, which are like kind of a mix of oil rig workers or oil workers and construction guys, I think. And, and there's a doctor, a physician, and there's a guy who claims to be an aeronautical engineer. So anyways, hilarity and and by hilarity, I mean sandstorm. Sandstorm happens, clogs up the engines. Frank Towns is forced to crash the plane. They crash the plane in the desert. Two of the guys die on impact. And then the rest of the crew tries to set up a makeshift camp to survive and wait for help. But then they find out that they're 130 some odd miles off course. So the chance of a rescue or anyone even looking for them in that area is slim to none. So the camp starts to divide about whether or not they should try to go and find an oasis or find an outpost or something or if they should stay and wait most of them anyways decide to stay and wait because it's really hot out in the desert who knew and also they're like 100 miles maybe from the nearest oasis so there's really no way they could just walk there so two or three of them head out to go walk away and try to find the oasis the rest of the group stays behind and then the german engineer guy says hey i can build a new plane out of this wrecked plane and everyone kind of 
doesn't believe him at first, but then after kind of realizing like, well, we're running out of water and food and stuff and we're going to die anyway, so might as well die building this plane, even if it doesn't work. So they all start building the plane and then they build the plane. They find out that there's raiders around, so that now they're like hurrying, trying to build the plane, but then the raiders go away, but not before they kill two of the people from the camp who try to talk to them, including the doctor. So now they don't have a doctor anymore. They finish building the plane and they fight and then you find out that the German aeronautical engineer guy Dorfman is not so much an airplane designer but a model airplane designer and he keeps emphasizing that model airplanes are different than toy airplanes but like it's okay we've come this far might as well see if it works they finish the plane they test the engines it takes them a minute but they finally get the engines going they pull the plane to their makeshift little runway and they make the plane take off and then they land near or crash. It doesn't really say anymore, but they land near a, an oil field or an oil rig and the men celebrate by splashing around in the uh, oasis pond. That's probably mostly sewage, but no one cares. That's the end of uh, the, the movie ends with kind of a sort of happy ending with most of everyone surviving, contributing greatly to building the plane. It has an overall positive ending. Yay. <laughs> nice change of pace from the past couple films that we've watched on this uh, yeah, yeah, on this trip. Yeah, it's because two weeks ago we watched a movie that didn't really have an ending. And then we watched a movie last week that kind of had a depressing ending. And three weeks ago we watched another movie that had kind of a depressing ending. So, yeah, final thoughts. I'm going to say this was a fantastic film. I thoroughly enjoyed this movie. Um, I had never seen this original before, and I actually thought the only thing the remake did better than this one is I thought the crash at the beginning was kind of cooler in the remake, but that's probably just because of modern special effects as opposed to what they had to work with in the 60s. Everything else across the board is way better in the original. The acting's better, the characters are better, the general plot's kind of the same, the ending is a little bit different in the remake. I, I didn't mention it in before because I, I wanted to make sure it wasn't the same. But in the remake, the Raiders find them. And there's a chase at the end. So the, the, the plane is trying to take off while the Raiders are chasing the plane. That's the tension in the remake. It's not necessarily if the plane's going to fly. Are they going to get it off the ground before the Raiders catch up to it? This one doesn't do that. You only see the Raiders very briefly in this one. And they're established as a presence. Like, definitely not friendly. But they're not antagonists like they are in the remake so I, I kind of enjoyed that the antagonists weren't necessarily any person or people more like well, actually the, the antagonist was the clock it was time because they were going to run out of water they're going to run out of food they're going to die that's why i like this one but um i'm going to say just so much of this was really good i really enjoyed richard attenborough's character in this movie really liked him a lot and i love the little touch that when Ernest Borgnine's character dies and he gave him that coat earlier in the movie. Richard Attenborough started wearing that coat after Towns came back from the desert without Ernest Borgnine's character, meaning he died. So he started kind of wearing it as either a tribute to him or kind of like a, hey, this guy gave me this coat. And, and it wasn't even said. They don't, he doesn't say in the movie, I'm wearing this coat because of, what was his name? Cobb? Was that Ernest Borgnine's character's name? Cobb? I think so. I, yeah. got, yeah, I haven't written down say, somewhere, but yeah. yeah. He never says it once in the movie. He never says, I'm wearing this coat because Cobb gave it to me. And Cobb's my bestest friend in the whole world, even though they just met, you know, 10 minutes before the crash. So I, I like that. I, I really did like that little touch. And there was other little, like, acting touches, not just from Richard Adler, from all the characters, like the British um, sergeant who didn't really have a whole lot of speaking lines, but had a lot of, like, facial expressions that were kind of like, most of his facial expression was like, screw this noise <laughs> but oh you know, yes but yeah he had some great facial expressions and of course i mean jimmy stewart's performance come on jimmy stewart could read the phone book and be oscar worthy and True. yeah I'm, I'm gonna keep circling back and just keep saying it. i liked this movie and it was i can see why the remake while it was a decent enough film is kind of meh and this one was so much better and rightfully regarded as a classic because it was just Really good across the board, with the exception of maybe the first, I'd say, 20 minutes of the movie was kind of rough at the beginning. But I don't want to steal too many thoughts from you guys. So, Josh, uh, what did you think of this film? Hated it. All right. Well, Tom, you're up. <laughs> <laughs> no, I actually really enjoyed the film. It's been a long time since I've seen the remake. I think 
it's been 16 years since I've seen the remake. And I honestly totally forgot about the chase scene in the end until you just brought that back up. So I'm probably have to go back and rewatch that. But uh, no, it's like I can definitely say that I have still yet to watch a Jimmy Stewart movie that I do not like. Jimmy Stewart turned in a solid performance. That one scene where he got pissed off at the one guy when he had the uh, shaver on. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Dude, you could just see the hate in his eyes. But no, he did a great job. I really like the sergeant character. He did a really good job of acting, like body language acting. I did feel, I think my only gripe about the movie is that it was 20 or 30 minutes too long. So I feel like they could have easily condensed that to be under two hours. I kind of agree with that. In fact, I kind of feel because they weren't a big deal in this movie, but they were a big deal in the remake, that the Raiders weren't really necessary. Yeah. The only really reason they were there in this movie was to kill off those two characters. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You could have cut that part out, tightened a whole bunch of stuff in the beginning, and it mm. would have made, still wouldn't have affected the film, is what you're saying. Yeah. Overall, no, I just, that, that'd be my only real gripe, is like, it just felt like it was a little too long. But um, I thought the acting was solid. I like the ending. I, I honestly like the ending a little bit better. I remember the remakes ending of them just flying off into the sunset. Like there's a cityscape on the horizon and they just flying towards. I kind of like this one better because it showed them on the ground. You know, like they made it so they didn't die in the landing. I feel like the George uh, Kennedy was a little underused. He was still an up and coming movie actor when this movie was made. Um, this is two years before his tour de force in Cool Hand Luke, which we watched last week. Well, keep in mind, um, this is 2020. Every movie in the 60s came out in the 60s. So. <laughs> right. I forgot about the floating timeline. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> See, I don't think I have much else. My brain isn't functioning because you guys keep me up so late. Old man Josh over here can't stay no, just, up till two thirty. You know what's sad morning. is I even did my workout yesterday morning, so that I could sleep in an extra hour and a half on Friday, so I would be able to not to be coherent at the end of the podcast. But then Tom's all like, "Guys, we'll get started at nine, and at ten thirty he finally gets on the line." Hey, well, don't blame me. Blame I work. I am blaming you, but. Guess- uh, I think that's all I've got for it. So um, before Tom takes it from me, I'm going to go ahead and hand it off to him. So, Thompson, (laughs) it's yours. Well, thank you, Josh. That's very gracious of you. I appreciate it. So seeing as how Josh has been up for so long, I'm going to keep my notes to an hour. So starting with the first five minutes of the film. No. Uh, I'm just going to add to your guys' notes. I liked this film by the end of it. The beginning was rough i found myself wondering why is this film so highly regarded this is a lot of padding i wasn't feeling any tension the crash like you said when we were watching it if it wasn't for the music we wouldn't have known something bad was happening but as it went on and people started dying and as the stakes rose you definitely started to feel that i'm grateful to the director for pulling that off but i will add to your thoughts josh yes they should have trimmed it down so much more it should have been an hour and a half hour 40 tops but you know they were trying to adapt it from a book and they were probably thinking like we got to keep this in it was in the book i'm glad they did not do the raiders in this one but watching this, I was expecting that. I can see why they did it in the 2000s version. You gotta keep, you gotta keep the pace going. You gotta keep things running. The remake's a little shorter too. I think the remake is it clocks in at just about 90 minutes or just a little bit over 90 minutes, but not as long as this one. Okay, so they were like us. They saw like, yeah, this needs to be tightened, but then they threw in something unnecessary. That doesn't surprise me. It does feel like they were trying to riff on Lawrence of Arabia. They were trying to capture that full scope and grandeur of Lawrence of Arabia, but didn't quite get it. But, you know, I can't blame them for trying. The music score was off and on. The directing was off and on. There were points in the film, like, it was a tense moment, but they had this weird chirpy music in the background. It's like, that does not fit the mood of this scene at all. Okay. And some of the shots with the sergeant, like when they were in the plane and he was looking at the wounded guy and such, like, is he going to kill him? Because he let the sergeant, he let the, excuse me, the officer basically left him outside to die. Never told anyone about him. So it's like, he's already letting one man die. Is he 
going to kill another? Is he going to be that guy? And he didn't, but you built him to be that character. You implied he would be. So it's okay, film. I enjoyed it. I'm not going to say it's a great film. It's it's in the good category. There's just too much wrong with it that I can say it's a great film. Barely even a classic. I kind of want to see the 2000 version now just to compare and contrast, but I wouldn't say this is a classic. This is a this is a middle of the road film for me, guys. Just I think this is uh, honestly to me, I, I wouldn't put this on the same standard as oh my, well, I wouldn't put it on par with Cool Hand Luke as far as classic goes. So I agree with you in that regard. I would almost put this like on a movie that came out five, ten years ago that wasn't a big hit, but it was a good movie. Because I mean, think about it. I never heard just and again, not trying to stroke my own ego, but I like to think that I have fairly decent grasp on what's at least known in the pop culture. So mm-hmm. I've mentioned this before that the three of us together have a fairly good scope of movies. And at least if we haven't seen it. We've heard enough about it. Like, perfect example is Cool Hand Luke. You guys have seen it. I hadn't seen it, but I knew about it. It's a good movie that people constantly throw back to. Like, this movie, I never even heard of. Like, I didn't, like I even told you at the beginning in my uh, initial thoughts, is like, I didn't realize that the 2004 version was a remake. So when I saw this up there, I was like, oh, is this the 2004? No, this is the original. The other one is apparently a remake. So it's like, mm-hmm. I don't think that this qualifies for classic status, like you said, Tom. I was wondering, you know, as I was watching this, and I, I actually agree with the both of you. I really enjoyed this film. I thought it was really good. And I think it's kind of worthy of its classic status, but I can see why it wasn't a hit in the theaters because it does need to be trimmed about 20 minutes. And I wonder if the reason why it's a classic and the reason why it's so well regarded, and I, I this is pure speculation on my part, was that by the time the home video market hit and you could get this movie on video, you can fast forward through the first 20 minutes of the film and kind of <laughs> get to the meat of it. Or even when you're watching it on TV, you can tune out the first like 20 minutes of it and then come back and sit down. You know, you can cut the crust off the sandwich and just eat the good part. Yeah. So I wonder if that's why this movie is so classically regarded. Honestly, the movie to me didn't really start getting going until the uh, British captain wanted to leave. Then the tension started between the camps. That, to me, was when the movie actually started to get really good. So I was wondering if maybe... I was actually thinking about this while I was watching it, is that maybe it's classic because when it got to the home video market or when it got on TV later in the 70s and the 80s, you could just either fast forward through the boring first 20, 25 minutes of the movie and just get to the meat of it, or you could just kind of tune it out on TV. Like, you can say, oh, they're showing Flight of the Phoenix tonight at 6 o'clock, but if you don't catch the movie until 6.30, it's okay. You know, now you're just watching the good parts. And back to add to that point, too, is there's not a lot in terms of directing. There's not a lot there to really draw you in. I noted that before my hypothesis that this would be a far more grounded directing style than what we're used to, more along the lines of Cool Hand Luke. And yeah, it was still very with the exception of a couple tight shots here and there it was but that kind of did a disservice because you needed for the desert scenes you needed someone who knew how to handle a wide angle lens to really get the scope of how desolate it is or in those really tight shots when things are getting really tense and it just wasn't there yeah this could also be attributed to the fact that they might not have actually been in the desert Oh, no, I think uh, they filmed most of this in... Oh, I'd have to look it up definitely California. a lot of them was on a soundstage, but some was filmed in the desert. You could tell, but I'm willing to bet that a lot of those tight shots was due to budget. Well, and, and you mm-hmm. can tell you can tell when they were filming, quote-unquote, at night that they were using a very classic um, movie-making uh, feature called Day to Night, where you put filters and stuff over the cameras to make it look like it's night, but you're still filming in the day because you need the light. Because there was not that many stars out that night, you no, know, like no which stars. Been. I even noted that the night sky was pitch black, which in the desert's almost impossible because there's very little cloud cover in the desert, obviously. And unless it's a full moon in the desert, you're still going to see a shit ton of stars in the sky. But uh, like I said, overall decent film. Now, do you feel like do, for any of you guys, were there any like in Cool Hand Luke, anyone that stole the show? Richard Attenborough. I would have to say I thought he did a good job, but I didn't. I wouldn't say he stole the show, at least from my perspective. Not in the same way uh, that George Kennedy stole. Yeah, the show. definitely not in that way. But uh, I thought uh, Jimmy Stewart turned in a solid performance. Nothing like groundbreaking or you know Oscar worthy. But mm-hmm. uh, no, I honestly say everybody did a g- good job. 
maybe just shy of a great job, but nothing super notable. Like, mm-hmm. I liked this movie, so I would definitely say that I enjoyed this movie. It was a good movie. Everything was good about it. Good character work mm-hmm. in a kind of an average sort of film. Actually, I'd yeah. say great character work. All the characters, I thought, played very well off of one another. If I had to pick one, I would probably pick the German uh, engineer. His cockiness and his uh, attitude towards everybody else, I thought, did a really good job of making him a pseudo-antagonist. The arrogance of him, just like mm-hmm. that stuffiness. And at the end, it's like, he's all show. He is a toy plane. He There's nothing to this man. We're going to die because of him. I think Adam Burrow personally stole it. Just the way he kind of went from stuttering and stammering to kind of a little more certain till the end. And then that whole breakdown when he realizes the German guy was just a toy maker. He just went nuts. I was perfect. Well, I have to say that overall, while we all three agree that this movie is good, almost a classic, not quite there yet. At least not for us. That's not to discredit this movie. Uh, overall, it was a much more positive experience than, well, last week was a good movie. Just had a sad ending. But much better than Swing Vote. And yes. a perfect lead in to next week. But that does it for tonight's episode. And as a reminder, you can find us on Spotify, iTunes, Amazon, or wherever you get your podcasts. And be sure to like and subscribe. And you can always be updated when new episodes drop every Tuesday at 6 p.m. Absolutely perfect for your Wednesday commute or your Wednesday afternoon at work. And also, please join our uh, Discord. Link's in the episode description. And you can find it on our site, uh, firepit.podbean.com. We uh, enjoy talking with you and other listeners like you. Right now, you can currently vote in our election campaign polls. So log on and uh, say hi. And as always, the email for the show is mentioned back in the interspersal segment. Also, as a reminder, we do have a Facebook and a Twitter page now. Links can be found where else? In the episode's description on firepit.podbean.com. Special shout out to Peggy, friend of the channel. Uh, Thanks always for listening and supporting us and always appreciate the uh, positive feedback. Thank you again. Yeah, um, sure she will. Peggy. I bet you uh, she voted for you too, huh, Dan? I would like to shout out, you know, as always, my parents. I think they're still listening at 1x speed now. And uh, Sync Lounge and Plex, who make it possible for us to watch these geographically separated, but together. And I want to just give a shout out to everyone else out there. Old listeners, current listeners, new listeners, and future new listeners. Thank you for listening and spreading the word. It is appreciated more than we can say. So keep that fire pit burning. Shut up. Shut up. They're announcing the election results. Polls are closed and the election results are in. The people came out and they overwhelmingly voted for their candidate with over 97% of the votes. The final votes are being tallied and in a climax of an ejaculation, the people are done stroking their small and enormous egos. You know who I'm talking to. So, guys, one of us won this, and I just gotta say that this entire election process with the two of you has been very terrible, absolutely terrible. You're both horrible human beings. Well, no disagreement there. I agree with Dan, but Tom, you were definitely the worst of us, though. Would you turn it back up? I can't hear it. 97.7% of the people have voted, and... Did they just say one of us got less than 3% of the vote? And now we are going live. Stay tuned as we take you now to her acceptance speech. Wait, her? What do they mean, her? Ah, uh, yes, ladies and gentlemen. I just want to thank you for your support. Peggy? What? what? This has been a brilliant campaign. I cannot thank you all enough for voting for me and telling the world just how wonderfully awesome I am. I guess that's why she was asking me for my vote the other day. My fellow contestants, I guess you would call them? Also, we're brilliant, but not brilliant enough in order to win this election. So, one of us didn't get less than 3% of the vote. All three of us, together, got less than 3% of the vote. This has been the best, most wholesome experience in my life, and I am honored to finally be able to take the lead, and... Hey, I was watching that. No! I'm done. You're done. It's done. And that's it for tonight. I guess be sure to join us next week as we wrap our Whistle Stop campaign trail. 
So what are we going to be watching, Dan? Uh, I can't remember. Something about uh, our... Tra- oh, yeah. our That's right. Our trail ends in Washington, Josh, with Jimmy Stewart, who we are taking from this film, into the classic, classic 1939 film, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. What a journey. What a campaign trail. Oh, it's been a long time getting from there to here, but I'm seriously excited, guys. And I am still seriously so hungry for just something roasted. Mm. I will have to circle back on that. But until then, I've been Tom. And I've been Josh. And I've been Dan. Thanks for listening. This has been a production of Curtain Call Entertainment, LLC. Stay safe out there. I haven't even taken an oath of office yet, and I already have so many plans for executive orders and amendments to the Constitution and change. Let's make change and not dimes and nickels because, you know, America has a change shortage right now. So, yeah, no, really, thank you for helping me out on this unopposed campaign. It is still an honor to know that I am the chosen one. She's getting more and more villainous. It's like, and I think she's, just she's become a villain. She's become drunk with power. <laughs>